Projecting. Hello everyone, it's good afternoon, welcome. Uh, for those of you that are visitors to the University, welcome to the University of the West of Scotland and another in our fantastic Inspiring Women event developed by UWS and supported by AKP Scotland and Managing Director uh, Ian McEwen is here today, Summer Dean, where are you? Uh, not here. <laughs> <laughs> His colleagues are out the front because they're, they're also involved in the Science Festival. Um, I'm thrilled to see so many people here. Uh, for the first of our Inspiring Women events and talks for 2019. And can I offer my personal welcome to staff, to students, to colleagues from Renfrewshire Council, along with guests from SPRE and SULSA. Uh, for those of you who arrived on campus through the main reception, you'll have been part of the Super Science Festival, which we run annually, an event that brings along uh, local schools onto the campus where they can interact with some of the fantastic science knowledge, facts and research that we undertake here at UWS. Uh, we had a, a health and safety target this morning of 300 uh, who could be allowed on campus. I'm reliably told that we approached that number but didn't quite exceed it. So for anybody who's a uh, health and safety officer in here, we didn't exceed our legal limits. Uh, we kept within that. We did have a lot of people in it. I uh, mingled around earlier this morning before uh, the students arrived and just had a quick look there again. Some fantastic stuff going on. Uh, and not just from the university, there was quite a lot of uh, stuff from within the university, but there were also people from outside the university there as well, and wonderful to see. And a further example of our commitment to developing science uh, interest in young people, and I know from a private school, not too very far from here, uh, they bring their students along to that festival every year, um, mainly because of some of the physics interactions. Um, they also acknowledge that very few of those students then come onto our university to do physics which we'll pick up later on the car. And of course we're encouraging everybody, not just girls, to consider STEM subjects. Now shortly you'll hear from Professor Sheila Rowan. And I'm certain that following her presentation uh, you'll walk away feeling uh, inspired and have gained uh, a series of new knowledges. And can I take this moment to thank Linda Aiken, who's just standing over here to my left, uh, for organising the Inspiring Women series and today's talk, and our events team uh, who are in and around this room and have been outside as well, uh, for their ongoing commitment to helping us organise uh, these events and other events which uh, are determined to improve the brand and reputation of the university. I'd also like to thank our external contributors to the Science Festival, including Glasgow Science Centre, the RNA, and Merck Group, and the Engine Shed. Now, I've been a passionate advocate of equality and diversity for many years, and I'm personally committed to the, all nine characteristics of the Equality Act. The Inspiring Women series was developed from early observations I made and concerns I found not long after arriving at UWS. And the aim was to provide a platform uh, of support and inspiration for female staff and students at UWS. The initiative provides a unique opportunity for staff, as well as members of the public, to hear from women who have been successful in their careers or lives, regardless of their background. And the diverse range of speakers we've had over the years has encouraged engagement and discussion, and the series is now a regular and vital element of the university events calendar. Having now hosted over 25 speakers, the series has become extremely successful uh, and recognised beyond the boundaries of UWS, even being shortlisted for awards. The Inspiring Women program now has become extremely successful and recognised, as I said, uh, beyond the university. It now has its own dedicated website, and we always are looking for new speakers. So if you have suggestions or would like to be involved, speak with Linda today, or visit our Inspiring Women website and page, and send us some details of people that you think we should approach. Now, today I'm delighted to welcome Professor Sheila Rowan, the Chief Scientific Advisor of Scotland uh, to UWS. Sheila, you're very welcome. Sheila is the Director of the Institute of Gravitational Research at the University of Glasgow, a position she's held since 2009. Sheila began her education at the University of Glasgow. That's not quite right, because she would have gone to primary and secondary school, but she uh, started her graduate level education at the University of Glasgow. I presume, you know, you did go to primary. I, 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 I don't, I'll Good. talk about that. <laughs> Where she completed a Bachelor of Science degree uh, in 19, uh, before following a PhD in 19, <laughs> conducting research on gravitational waves. After this, her work was split between the University of Glasgow and the Edward Ginson Laboratory at Stanford University. Uh, since 2003, Sheila has been based solely in Glasgow and was appointed Professor of Experimental Physics in 2006. Sheila's expertise and huge contribution to science has been very well recognised, gaining countless awards and fellowships throughout her career. She was part of the team that contributed to the 2016 Special Breakthrough Prize 
in fundamental physics for their work on the first detection of gravitational waves from the collision of two black holes, an extraordinary scientific <coughs> discovery which included our own at the time, uh, UWS Professor Stuart Reed, who was in the audience here today. Stuart, you're very welcome. Sheila began her role as Chief Scientific Advisor to the Scottish Government in 2016, in which she provides a scientific perspective on Scottish Government policy and advocates for benefits of science to society. I think something we all have a passionate interest in. We're hugely excited and honoured to have you here today, Sheila, uh, to give us insights into your journey and the challenges facing women in science. I'm certain you'll find, uh, we will all find your talk engaging, inspiring, thought-provoking as you navigate us through your journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction and for the opportunity to come and talk today. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of today's events. Um, I had a, a, a little um, a tour of some of the science exhibits that were outside earlier today and they looked fantastic. Um, and I'm going to give you a talk that covers both of my roles today, both as Chief Science Advisor, um, of which I spent part of my time uh, doing, and partly about research and the, the research that I've been involved in throughout my career and some of the challenges associated with that. So I'll give you a perspective on, on both of those things. So a little bit about who I am. Well, as you heard, since 2016, um, I've held an appointment three days a week as Chief Science Advisor to the Scottish Government. Um, at the same time, um, I retain my position at the University of Glasgow I'm director of the Institute for Gravitational Research there, um, which has about 70 people overall within the Institute. And they're all engaged, and I'm engaged on the research side, on um, detecting and studying gravitational waves, gravitational signals that are coming to us here on Earth, produced far out in the universe in astronomical events. It's a different kind of astronomy, and I'll talk also about that and, the, and, and my research journey through that. I did indeed go to school before I went to university, you are correct. Um, and indeed I studied at Maxwell High School in Dumfries, uh, down in the southwest of Scotland. And in fact I was back in Dumfries last night talking to the local astronomical society, again on, on a research front, talking to, to them about our discoveries and, and, and where the field is going. Um, I then did my undergraduate and PhD, both in straight physics, at the University of Glasgow. I moved in 1998 uh, to Stanford University, actually with a split appointment um, as a postdoc, partly at Stanford, partly at Glasgow. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that and where that fit into the picture. Back in Scotland in 2003 to Glasgow. Um, back into the Institute uh, uh, working on gravitational waves there. And so I'll talk about both of, both of those aspects of, of the role. Um, first of all, what does a chief scientific advisor actually do? What is the job and, and, and what do I do within it? It's partly acting as a champion for science, both inside and outside Scottish Government. And my role sits where science meets policy and it can intersect in, in different ways. There are sort of three key strands to that role. The first one is science for policy and that can be how science can inform government policy across all policy areas. There are ones that are more obvious to think of but actually anywhere that science, science advice can add value to the, the policy making of the Scottish Government's work. There's also policy for science so I'm part of that and I'll talk a little bit about that. For instance, there's been involvement in the, the Scottish Government's STEM education and training strategy, co-chairing co an advisory, a couple of advisory groups related to that. And then the third part, and a very important part, is science for society. Speaking at events like this one, supporting the science public engagement sector in Scotland, which is extremely important and we have a, a very strong and healthy sector there to, 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 to support. So supporting science then inside and outside of government itself. And with inside government, part of that role is about championing the use of scientific evidence and science advice as part of the policy making process. Well, what does that mean? It means that I can be asked to provide science advice 
and advice on wider issues affecting science and research to officials and ministers where that can add value to what they're doing. On the wider science policy side, that includes talking to stakeholders, um, both in the academic sector and in the business sector, it's importantly for Scotland, helping to promote innovation, uh, see where there are areas where, um, from the government's point of view, research and industry could work more closely together for mutual benefit. And that's an area where I think at UWS there are many good examples, uh, uh, particularly strong examples. Um, I mentioned the STEM strategy. Um, that's an area where uh, there are many important stakeholders from a, a diverse range of groups. I co-chair an advisory committee alongside Professor Ian Hunter from Strathclyde University. And many of us have interests in STEM education. And so that group has um, uh, representatives on it from business, from the learned societies uh, who, who steward our, our different subjects, education at all stages, universities, the college sector, um, science centres and festivals that are important reach out that we do, uh, and also parents, again, another, another key group with strong interest in STEM education. And in making sure that young people, and I saw some of them again outside today, are aware of the opportunities that there are, that studying science can open up for them is absolutely key. It's something that that group is passionate about, and I saw again today how that resonates <laughs> with people here uh, from the activities and the aims of today's event. We also talked about, uh, as part of the role Scottish, research and innovation and that link with business. So another part of my role is, is often to go out, talk to groups in that space, understand what is happening here in Scotland, where are our key strengths, not just again taking that knowledge again from, from what we have in Scotland and promoting it further afield, whether that's at Westminster, so that across the UK there's an understanding of the strengths that we have here in Scotland, or internationally, and I'll, I'll talk uh, more about that, about the importance of our international links. Um, but there's an example there from a field that's not my own, again, offshore renewables, where in Scotland we have you know, really leading expertise that's of interest internationally, going to the US, working to, to help make links between academics there, our businesses, again, promoting what Scotland can do. So those science choices for young people um, are incredibly important and we have a great story to tell in Scotland. And most people are familiar with stories from the past. Again, the, the great scientists we think about, Alexander Fleming, um, Penicillin, John Logie Bear, James Watt, our engineering heritage. <clears throat> but our excellence isn't <coughs> confined to the past. It's a tradition that takes us forward. And we have some amazing developments happening across Scotland in different areas right now <coughs> in, in pure science, in science and technology, and the translation of that out into the economy. And they are ones that are very interesting and often not ones that we think about when we think about what's happening in Scotland <coughs> and what we're really good at. Mm. Um, our video games industry is, is a technology industry and a remarkable success story. 30 years in the making. Other universities, the Abertay University is recognised as a pioneer of video games education. Many of the industry's big names have connections to Dundee. Just two examples here. 4G Studios, who are based in Dundee, who work in different editions of Minecraft, an enormous, an enormous um, um, a hit. And Rockstar North, now based in Edinburgh, developers of Grand Theft Auto and the Red Dead Redemption series. This is beyond my ken, I have to say. I've now got to the age where we're talking about a different generation. But these hold multiple sales records. It's technology, again, in a different way, in a modern way, in terms of, of thinking, thinking about how technology contributes. Another one that I think has been a surprise, actually, sort of stealth uh, success story that's, that's um, come to light. Um, to, the, to be highlighted sort of more recently is the space sector in Scotland. You know, we, when we think about Glasgow industries, again, we often think about the past, the heavy construction industries, shipbuilding, maybe media, financial services, but you probably wouldn't think about space, again, if you're a young person, think about opportunities for exciting science here in Scotland. 
But in 2016, on average, six satellites were manufactured and ready to fly in Glasgow. Again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a remarkable success story for Scottish science. This is something that um, some of the science advisory uh, system in, in uh, Scottish government has been looking at, seeing real opportunities there for government and agencies to work together, their public sector interest and some of the environmental data produced by Earth observation satellites. And uh, the report that we looked at highlighted more than 120 companies who are engaged in the space sector or in that supply chain. So again, if you're a young person in Scotland, I think this is a story that's not well enough known. You don't have to necessarily go to the US to work in the space business. That's something that we're actually very successful at here in Scotland, again with lots of recent developments in that area, and real opportunities, I think, still to come there. So that's a little bit about, as Chief Science Advisor, some of the things I'm engaged in, some of the things in, uh, that it's important to highlight. But of course, before I was Chief Science Advisor, and I still am of course, a scientist. And I was inspired at quite a young age to study science. Um, really from, from, I was in my late years at primary school, I thought studying science was one of the most fascinating things that you could do, one of the most exciting things that you could do. To study our universe and understand it better at a very fundamental level. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that and that, that journey um, that brought me to the point that I am just now, I'm working in gravitational wave studies. And it's been an incredibly exciting few years, not least in 2017, when we saw the award of the Nobel Prize in Physics go to my three colleagues here, Ray Weiss, Barry Barish and Kip Thorne. And um, on the slide here, you'll see some words from the Nobel Committee, what they had to say about why they, they decided on this award. Um, for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector, I'll talk about what that is, and the observation of gravitational waves, these gravitational signals from far out in the universe. But the Nobel Committee also said, um, what's the words that are underneath here, <laughs> and wanted to note that this project was a collaborative project with over a thousand researchers from more than 20 countries, a real international project. And that to working together, these researchers realised a vision that's nearly 15 years old. It was, it was a long time in the making. And each of these laureates, of course, were invaluable to the success of this, again, and the Nobel Prize, of course, went to the three of them, but with a real recognition that there are major contributions from a number of partners including partners here in the UK, and I want to talk again a little bit about, about the journey of the UK through, through this story. These are the logos, again, of some of those institutions from all those countries around the world, and if you look in there, you'll find the University of the West of Scotland, as we heard at the beginning, as a, as a contributor to this, this fantastic story. Again, a real collaborative, international and diverse project. So what's that side of things all about what are gravitational waves, why was this an exciting thing to do? Um, what are gravitational waves? Well, you'll see here Einstein, he's key in our story. This is a cover of Science, uh, again from, I think, 2015, which was the 100th anniversary of his general theory of relativity, it, which, which explains his vision for how gravity, um, what gravity does in our universe. And, in fact, we can think of it in very simple terms. We think that that's a very mathematical theory, but if you think in the cartoon here of our universe, if it had nothing in it, no stars, no planets, it would be a flat, sort of empty place. We add here the Earth, a planet, to our universe, and that mass of the Earth curves the space around it. And that's fundamentally what general relativity says, that matter, mass, tells space around it how to curve. You can imagine if we put down a second object in our curved space here, it would try and roll towards the Earth. That curvature in Einstein's picture is gravity. It makes these objects look like they're attracted together. You can imagine then if we have 
a couple of objects somewhere out in space, two stars that are spiralling round one another, they're stretching and squashing the space around them. And that stretching and squashing, those changes in the curvature of space, space-time, are gravitational waves. Those are gravitational signals being sent out by um, stars far out in space, travelling across the universe. And that is what we have been engaged in trying to detect, pick up these gravitational signals to do astronomy. Because as we'll see, what those signals look like um, depends on what produced them. So we can do astronomy in a very different way. As those signals spread out, however, um, by the time they reach us on Earth, they're very, very weak. We needed to build phenomenally sensitive instruments to detect them. And that stretching and squashing of space by the time we're trying to measure distances here on Earth turns out to mean changes um, of, of distances here less than a thousandth the size of a subatomic particle. Tiny, tiny, tiny effects. So that, that challenge was to build instruments that could do this. Those instruments are based on laser interferometry. Again, for, for anyone who's, who's studied undergraduate physics, they'll recognize this. Light from a laser split into two, travels out some distance, and in each case, bounces off a mirror. That, that mirror you can see there is marking a position in space, somewhere here on the surface of the Earth. And as a gravitational wave passes by, it effectively moves the position of this mirror. That's how it looks to us. As the light then bounces off, the mirrors is sent back. This light wave comes off, adds up, or cancels out, depending on how far each of these waves has traveled. We see the light flicker at the beam splitter. And in looking for those tiny flickers, we're searching for these gravitational signals produced far out in the universe. And our instruments are based on that technique. As you might guess, we have to work very hard to stop anything else moving those mirrors other than the astronomical signals that we're interested in. But that was done. And the instruments um, that were built, again, by this big collaboration, were the LIGO instruments. Here are pictures of the sites. Um, one in Hanford in Washington State in the US. And you can see for scale, it's about the size of a supermarket with these four kilometer long arms with the laser beams disappearing off into the distance and coming back. The other in Livingston in Louisiana. And so much of those decades, again part of my work, um, was spent trying to understand how to build these big instruments to make them sensitive enough. And the first thing, of course, that we detected, the, the, the thing that, that, that resulted in the Nobel Prize, was the stretching and squashing of space from two black holes. Again, when I was a young, um, a young person, sort of uh, at the end of primary school, beginning of secondary school, these were enormously fascinating things to think about. Black holes, stars <coughs> that have got to the end of their life, their core has collapsed down with gravity um, so strong in that region of space that nothing could escape its pull, not even light. So enormously exotic objects far out in the universe. <clears throat> As they spiral round one another, Einstein tells us they stretch and squash the distances in space round them till these black holes actually smash into one another sending out a shudder, a ripple, across space-time, travelling across the universe until that signal reached us here on Earth back in September 2015. The stretching and squashing underneath here, again, I'll just put that up and down so you can see it, this, this, um, this, uh, this uh, pattern underneath is what we measure here on Earth as distances are actually stretched and squashed, we're all stretched and squashed, just a tiny amount, as this signal passed through us um, in September 2015, and our instruments picked it up. And <clears throat> this is the actual signal arriving on the top there at the two detectors. It's that very characteristic wobbling. 
Built into that are the properties of those black holes, those, those exotic objects, very difficult to study any other way. We know that one of those black holes was 36 times the mass of our sun, 129 times the mass of our sun. That they collided <coughs> 1.3 billion light years away, so a light year is a distance, the, the distance that light travels in a year. When they smashed into one another, they made a new black hole about the size of Iceland, but 62 times the mass of our sun squashed into the size of Iceland. With that black hole spinning about 100 times a second, <coughs> with a point on its, its event horizon, if you like, its surface, travelling at nearly half the speed of light. These are phenomenal objects, very difficult to study any other way, but we can do it using this kind of, this kind of technique. And it was a long journey to get to that point, starting over 100 years ago with Albert Einstein predicting these signals um, existed. It took 50 years for anyone to really believe they could build instruments that might be able to pick up these signals. And then it required a series of um, developments, including in some cases technologies to be invented, before we could get to the point um, where these instruments were operating and able to pick up these signals. And a fantastic success story. And people often talk about it as if it was a smooth journey. You know, all the, all the successes, detectors were funded, detectors were built, you know, partnerships were formed. <coughs> but I want to talk today actually about some of the challenges in that. And I think that's important to do because when we see success, it's, 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 it's often something we think it's so difficult to aspire to that someone else has had that success on a smooth path. But it never, of course, works exactly that way. And it started off with a number of different individual groups in different countries around the world in the lab, building their own small prototype detectors, trying out some of these technologies, and not really collaborating. These groups were, to some extent, in competition. So before my time, we glossed over dates earlier, but I'll be honest in a bit, we'll talk about dates. But this is before my time in the field. Um, individual groups trying out some of the technologies. And then in the 1980s, colleagues in Germany started to think they knew enough about the technology to build big detectors. And so they put together proposals, plans for a large gravitational wave antenna in Germany, proposal for the construction of a large laser interferometer for the measurement of gravitational waves to try and meet this challenge, make these first detections. And so those proposals were written. At the same time, here in Scotland, we were thinking of our own detector project again, but before, just a bit before I started in the, in the, the field here, in the late 1980s. You can see 1986, here's our sketch for a British long baseline gravitational wave observatory for our own big instrument. And the plan was actually to build it in Tents Muir Forest in Fife. You can see typical, uh, beautiful Scottish weather there. Um, uh, not like those lovely clear pictures I showed you of the South the United States, but there was, a, there was a plan to do this. Again, we were thinking in Scotland about this. Um, there wasn't enough support in either of those countries to get the individual projects off the ground. And in fact, the agencies in both countries suggested we work together, that the, the German groups and the British groups, the Scottish groups, and our colleagues in Wales get together. And so we did think about one project with both countries for a joint German-British gravitational wave detector. So the hints of where success is going to come from is in collaboration. And in fact, at this point, sort of, uh, I was an undergraduate, and I started doing a summer project with a research group at the University of Glasgow, working on little interferometers, again, ones in the, ones in the lab. And it was very exciting for the, for the group in Glasgow. There was support promised. Um, but a couple of things then happened. There was a change in the funding agency. We discovered there just wasn't enough money. And in Germany, there was reunification. And as, uh, as exciting as that was, it was expensive. And so funding couldn't then be found in Germany. And so this was a huge disappointment. People really thought for the, the first time, 
Mm -hmm. And the colleagues that I was working with, again, uh, my supervisor at that point in the, in the group in Glasgow, thought, you know, this was really going to go ahead. It'd be an enormous, enormous excitement. So just as I started my career in the field, it all went sadly wrong. No funding was available. But elsewhere around the world, some of those other groups were um, proposing and, and having their detectors funded. So as a PhD student, I spent my time working on technology potentially to be used in big detectors when it really wasn't clear for us in the UK how we could contribute to the global effort. So that was the, 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 the time that I started. But as a student, this was also I was slightly oblivious. Um, it was all still a very exciting area to work on. Again, rather than be totally set back, those groups got together, um, thought hard about how a smaller detector, a cheaper detector, but with more sophisticated technologies perhaps than were being considered for the big instruments, how that might look. And so a new um, concept came about for a German UK detector called Geo 600, again, so this was during my PhD, um, with support from various uh, German and UK institutions, but a much smaller device. So that indeed did come about, developing some of those advanced technologies, and again, I worked on that as a, as a PhD student. And I got my first job, my first post-PhD job, on the basis of a five-minute talk a five minute talk. It was a big conference at Stanford University in the United States. Um, one of the great big conferences in the field and I managed to get a slot to present some of my work and it was five minutes and I thought, well, five minutes? So I had three minutes to actually talk and two minutes for questions. So I went all the way to California um, to give my talk and out of that I got an invitation in fact to spend a few months um, in the lab, working as a visiting scholar at Stanford. Now, it's not that my three minute talk was so fantastic, you should not be misled, but I was just in the right place at the right time. The group at Stanford were interested in getting connected better to the existing groups in the field. If you want to do that, the best thing you can do is exchange people. So, I happened to be working in something that they were quite expert at, so they said, would you like to come, spend a few months here, work on that with us? I was absolutely delighted at the end of my PhD. I did that, and I built links during that time that really have, have continued uh, to, the current, to the current day. Went back to Glasgow for a couple of years, working on that technology for GEO, and then actually went back to Stanford again with a longer term, a longer term position. And I spent five years there, I mentioned that at the beginning, split most of my time, three quarters of my time in California um, and one quarter of my time back in Glasgow and I went back and forth <coughs> once every three months working in the lab in both places. And I worked in the Ginston Laboratory which is again a, a very interesting place, it's an interdisciplinary lab, brings together scientists from applied physics, from physics, electrical engineering, some of them working in material science, some in optics. Um, which now I think people recognise as a fantastic way to do different things, is to put scientists from different fields together. So when I was there, I was working on the technology for that UK uh, German Geo 600 detector, whilst with my colleagues again thinking about how actually some of that advanced technology might go into these bigger detectors, the ones that had been thought of in the US, and actually the technology for still things that we're thinking about for the future beyond where we are just now. But as a young person, a young uh, newly finished PhD, spending five years at that time in the Bay Area was quite a remarkable experience. My time there coincided almost exactly with the, sort of, the big boom, the internet sort of uh, dot com boom and bust. It was quite an extraordinary time to be there. I think there are sometimes different times in history where where you are feels like the centre of the universe, whether it's London in the 60s, New York in the 80s. At this time, being in the Bay Area, it felt like there was such a lot happening. As of course we know, it was a bubble, the dot-com bubble, but the world really changed during that time in terms of, what, in terms of technology. 
in terms of what we, we now take for granted. Between 1996 to 2000, the tech stock exchange, the NASDAQ stock exchange, went from 600 to 5,000 points. Huge um, explosion um, of uh, companies, new companies, um, most of which were internet and technology related. That was an amazing environment as a, as a young scientist to be in. Um, and you can see the stats of those 457 initial public offerings more than 100 doubled in price in the first day of trading. Quite an extraordinary time. And this is the NASDAQ during that time. The arrows show when I arrived and when I left. But correlation is not causation. I take no responsibility either for the boom or the bust. But it did mean it was uh, an extraordinary learning experience. Um, and, and, and not in pure science, but just being in that environment and, uh, and seeing what was happening around about me in technology. And the opportunity to be there, again, in a different country, working internationally, transformed my vision of what science can do and of what my career actually ended up being. So in the bigger picture, that was my, part of my journey through this. But in the bigger picture, those other big projects that were getting funded, the LIGO project in the US, hundreds of millions of dollars, very large project led by Caltech and MIT, it turns out it's a bit like the space business. If you're launching a satellite mission, by nature you have to use things that you know are going to work. You have to actually use technology that's not necessarily right at the cutting edge. You have to be a bit more conservative. Because we had a smaller instrument, we'd had to think creatively that setback turned into a positive. And our, um, on a small <coughs> scale, on our instrument, ability to try out new technologies led us to be in a good position to collaborate when those big projects needed to think about what they were going to do next. And they are big. This is a bit of an aerial uh, overview of the LIGO sites. You can see there's that four kilometre long arm. This is the Louisiana site. Again, just to give you a feeling of the scale, these are enormous, enormous projects, huge infrastructures. In geo, we're much smaller. This is a picture of the geo site. You can see the scales much smaller indeed. This is out in, in Hanover in Germany. But inside that smaller infrastructure was high technology. And some of that was technology again that I and, and colleagues in Glasgow had worked on. So during that time then, the vision for the next stages came along with we in the UK well placed to work with our colleagues together in the US to think about making the advanced LIGO instruments and, and with colleagues internationally making this next step. And from the UK, what we partly uh, designed and supplied were actually some of the suspensions, those mirrors that I talked about in the interferometers that have to not be disturbed by anything else other than our gravitational wave signals, have to be isolated. And so, uh, you can see on the right hand side that pink sheen is on the front face of, of, of a mirror which is actually hanging on a fused silica fibres and that was part of the UK's contribution, technology tested out in GEO, um, but then uh, going into the big US detectors. And so when that exciting moment of discovery came, you saw the Nobel Prize winners at the beginning. The statements, though, about how many people were involved, it meant that uh, despite those initial setbacks, um, there was a recognition of the part that the UK had played, that Scotland had played. And I know there are other folks in the room here, um, Stuart at the back and Caroline Cantley, um, also from the, the originally the group in Glasgow, who helped project manage, again, uh, some of that delivery to this. So there was a recognition of the real contribution that, that scientists here in the UK had made to that initial discovery. So where are we and where are we going? What does the future hold? Well, we have just finished a second observing run with those instruments with another big detector in Europe, the Virgo detector, joined us in August 2017. Um, made lots of exciting discoveries. Again, I'll just give you a quick quick overview of those. 
We're here, just in 2019, working up to turning on these instruments again after a period of, of commissioning and improving them a bit further. And so rather than the, just that first collision, there are now 10 pairs of black hole collisions um, that were detected during those observing runs, allowing us to pick up the gravitational wave signals, learn about the properties of these objects. Again, we really, we really could not have studied before. And the other big excitement, of course, was a different kind of collision, this time of two neutron stars, another exotic kind of star. Not a black hole this time, again, this, this region of space that's, that's uh, super strong gravity, but very dense stars smashed into one another, um, produced light, infrared light, ultraviolet, picked up by many different telescopes, and I won't go through this in detail, but there were special, special issues of, sort of science and nature, 100 papers all uh, appeared at the same time talking about some of the fabulous science that can be done, really very different way that we have to work with our colleagues in astronomy and study our universe, including um, determining where the heavy elements in the periodic table have come from. You can see our colour code here that in particular, again of excitement, I think was picked up with platinum and gold in the universe being produced from nuclear reactions as these stars smashed into one another. And that particular story made the front page of the Financial Times of all places. I can only assume as they were interested, the readers were interested in where that gold and platinum was really <laughs> coming from. Came a, a view to a view to the future maybe. So that's quite exciting. More of these detectors are coming. Again, we'll have a global, a global network. It's a really international field. <coughs> and actually, everything I talked about is still just part of the story of what this new astronomy can do with our detectors on the ground. There will also be detectors in space, again, um, detecting other kinds of these signals. Pure science, again, of fascinating to me, um, but also of interest is what some of these technologies can do for us now, again, in, in the nearer term. And so some of the spin-offs, again, folks uh, here at UWS I know are familiar with and, and, and connected with, um, taking some of the gravitational wave technologies um, and applying them in cell biology to use mechanical vibrations um, to stimulate stem cells to turn into bone, again, with potential clinical appli applications of Stuart at the back here, again, has been one of the key folks working, working on that. I talked about collaboration. Many countries, different people. Um, if you want to solve difficult questions, having everyone think the same way is not the best way to do that. Difficult challenges need creativity, and creativity comes from diversity. And I think that's incredibly important for us to recognise in science. We know, again, there are still gender-related issues at play in science, that girls and young women are more likely to choose biology. Boys and young men still want to choose chemistry, physics, engineering, computer science. So keeping women in STEM, particularly also in more senior roles, is still an issue. It's a complicated problem. There's no easy way, there are, but there are, there are ways that can make a difference. And there's a lot of leadership here in Scotland, again, engaged in this area. Um, reports, recent reports from the Royal Society of Edinburgh, looking at the challenges and routes forward in this area. The Institute of Physics has a fantastic um, uh, programme, improving gender balance, um, going into schools and really examining with people uh, 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 ways in which we can keep girls interested in science, the Royal Society of Chemistry. <coughs> and it really is needed. This is a picture from nearly 23 years ago now. I mentioned space-based detectors. This was the first conference in the Rutherford Appleton Lab, the first LISA symposium, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, thinking about a detector in space. And I am in that picture. That's actually me there. Again, I've just graduated um, with my PhD. Um, the, the, I think potentially even that day, left my family in the restaurant went to the airport, flew down, went to the conference to give a talk. But if you look at this picture, you'll see I'm the only woman in that picture, actually. Um, I am delighted to see that things have changed, and I wanted to highlight to you some of my colleagues in the gravitational waves field. Nergis Mavavla, who has a MacArthur Genius Award, um, she's a professor 
Um, I think she's currently you know, Deputy Department Head at MIT in Boston in the Gravitational Waves field. Gabriela Gonzalez from Louisiana State was our spokesperson during the discovery time. Norna Robertson, one of my colleagues again, who Caroline knows well from, from Glasgow, is now uh, jointly at Glasgow and uh, in California Institute of Technology. Susan Scott, who works in general relativity in Australia. Laura Cardinati of Georgia Tech, currently deputy spokesperson for our collaboration. Alicia Sante started her own group in, uh, in, in Mallorca. Joan Centrella, deputy director of astrophysics at NASA. Maria Alessandra Papa, Professor of Physics and again former uh, data, data lead in our collaboration. Senior women doing a fantastic job in my field. And more recently, these are just faces from my group in Glasgow. Um, many of them either doing PhDs, have done their PhDs, past group members, again, Caroline uh, on the list. Um, a whole number of them, some of whom have stayed, of course, in academia, some of whom have gone out to a really diverse range of occupations. Erin McDonald, currently in Los Angeles, engineering, gone all around the world. And it's really important that we highlight these successes and celebrate diversity in STEM. Um, there's fantastic work by Equate Scotland, a recent social media campaign, that this is what a STEMinist looks like. We, of course, this week had International Day of Women and Girls in Science and the MRC Suffrage Science Campaign, not just celebrating uh, uh, women in science, but giving them opportunities to connect. It's really important that we do this, that we have these examples there, because our society and our economy will benefit most fully if we have all the people who are interested and can contribute able to engage in STEM. Scotland is a great place to do science. Just to finish, again, one of the other things uh, that the Scottish Science Advisory Council, again part of the advisory system, has done is commission a, a recent report launched in the last couple of weeks to look at how Scotland is doing in science, and we are doing well. We are number one in the UK in terms of publications per researcher, but extremely productive. Number one in the UK in terms of citations per researcher, those publications are good. Um, so there is a lot to celebrate, but we can't rest on our laurels. We have to work hard to make sure that that continues. If I have one message, again, from my experience and, and the challenges I've seen in the gravitational waves field, it's a, a big success now. It was not always that way. It required taking risks, again, when there were setbacks, not giving up. And I think that's, that's absolutely key. Um, we do have worldwide opportunities here um, in Scotland. We need to get that message across to protect the talent pipeline that we have, encourage young people to choose those STEM skills for life. It was a positive choice for me and I'm convinced it will be for them. Thank you very much.